Hi, I'm Kevin. Welcome to my cave. This is the fifth video in our journey toward building a usable differential amplifier from discrete transistors. When we broke off last time, we had an amplifier that was quite usable in a configuration with a gain of 10. When we tried to make it into a follower, though, we had trouble. We had designed an amplifier that would amplify the difference between the voltages at its two inputs, which we labeled with plus and minus signs. The amplifier consisted of a so-called long-tailed pair of transistors, which computed the difference between the voltages at the two ports, cancelled out any common signal very effectively, and applied a little bit of gain. We followed that stage with a common emitter amplifier to boost the gain further. The combined gain of the two stages was about 500. Like all common emitter amplifiers, that second stage has a relatively high output impedance, so we added a push-pull follower to lower it to a more usable figure. We decided to treat this circuit as a module, and tested it out with negative feedback. When we used a voltage divider with a ratio of 10 to 1 in the feedback loop, the amplifier worked almost perfectly. The output mirrored the input with a gain just under 10. But when we replaced the divider with a simple wire, which we expected to give us a follower, we saw the trace thickened on the oscilloscope screen, indicating an unwanted high-frequency signal. Zooming in, we saw that the circuit was oscillating at about 13 MHz. We ended the video there with a promise to dive into the problem in this episode. Let's take a closer look. Before we continue, I ask you to indulge me for a brief public service announcement. Your support for this channel has been really outstanding, and the channel has grown to where I'm seeing a small amount of revenue from YouTube. I love you all. You've been wonderful. And so I know you'll respond to the call to take care of one another that I put at the end of every video. I've decided that the whole of my January 2025 payment from YouTube will go to the Against Malaria Foundation. The Foundation's sole mission is to provide insecticidal nets to people living in places where malaria is endemic. Its performance is outstanding among the charities that I've examined in terms of lives saved per dollar spent, to say nothing of the humanitarian and economic benefits of reducing disease burden in the tropical nations of the world. If you are inclined to fight bugs in more places than our circuits, I hope you'll join me in supporting this charity. There should be an affiliate link down there, or up there, or in any case somewhere nearby. Thank you so much for your generosity. And back to the video. So what's causing this oscillation? Well, let's look at what's going on inside our amplifier in detail. For the feedback to work, an output that's too high needs to cause the amplifier to push it back down, and conversely, an output that's too low needs to cause the amplifier to push it back up. We can verify that we have that here. If the output is too high, that will come in as a signal displaced upward at the minus input. The emitter of the first transistor will follow that signal and be displaced upward. That will become the baseline voltage of the second transistor, displacing its collector upward as well. The gain stage is an inverting amplifier, so its output will be displaced downward, and so will the output of the final push-pull stage. So the feedback moves in the right direction. All is well. With a low-frequency AC signal, we see much the same thing. We get an error signal oscillating up and down at the input. It's copied through the first and second transistors, it gets inverted at the gain stage, and then the inverted signal appears at the output. The signal is opposite to the input signal. Everything's fine. But now let's start moving to higher frequencies. There are stray capacitances everywhere. They can't be avoided. So every stage will have a little bit less gain as the frequency gets higher and higher, because stray capacitance to ground makes every stage look like a low-pass filter. But more importantly, every stage will delay the signal a little bit as it charges and discharges a stray capacitance. So now the signal at the emitters of the differential pair will be delayed a little bit behind the input. The signal coming out of the pair will be delayed a little bit more. The signal coming out of the gain stage will be delayed more still, but remember that it's still an inverting stage. And the push-pill pair will delay it even a little bit more. At some frequency, the delays will add up to half a cycle. That means that the feedback signal will now be in the same direction as the input. Our negative feedback has changed to positive feedback. 
If the gain of the amplifier is more than unity at this frequency, the signal at this frequency will build and build. The amplifier will oscillate. Somewhat paradoxically, the cure is to introduce even more low-pass filtering. We can slow the amplifier down to where the gain around the feedback loop is less than one before the frequency reaches the point where the output is out of phase. This process is called frequency compensation, and we'll have a lot more to say about the subject in the future. The usual way to add that low-pass filter is a little different from what we've seen before. It depends on a phenomenon called the Miller effect, which I haven't yet discussed in the channel, so let me spend a few moments describing it. We'll begin by considering an inverting amplifier. It could be any amplifier with negative gain. I'm just drawing a simple common emitter amplifier here because we're familiar with it. An obvious way to have the amplifier be a low-pass filter would be to add a capacitor to ground. We don't need the full-up filter equation here. All we need to think about is the way a capacitor behaves in the time domain. The current through the capacitor is its capacitance times the rate of change of the voltage across it. But now let me take out that capacitor, and instead add a capacitor to the amplifier's output. The output voltage of the amplifier is some negative constant times the base voltage, plus a bias. That means that the voltage across the capacitor will be the base voltage times 1 plus the amplifier's gain, minus the bias voltage. And the current through the capacitor will be its capacitance times the rate of change of that voltage. That's exactly 1 plus the amplifier gain times the current that would have flowed in the capacitor in the first arrangement. So the feedback capacitor has the same effect on the circuit as a capacitor a plus 1 times larger connected to ground. We can make do with a much smaller capacitor. We can also usually dispense with the resistor shown here, and instead use the output resistance of the previous stage. We'll see more about the Miller effect in future episodes, but mostly about what to do about it when we don't want it. Most transistors have a few picofarads of unwanted capacitance between collector and base. When the Miller effect magnifies it, it absolutely kills high-speed circuits. But let's get back to our circuit here. There's only one inverting stage in play, so there's an obvious place for our compensation capacitor. A tiny amount of capacitance is enough. Let's try it out. I'll try 33 picofarads between the base and collector of the gain stage. And the signal cleans right up. So I was right in my guess that the thing was oscillating. Just out of curiosity, I rebuilt the setup where I had trouble measuring common mode gain of the complete amplifier because of all the hash on the signal. The scope trace was still ugly without the compensation capacitor. But after adding the capacitor, there was no problem measuring common mode feed through. About 3 millivolts on a 10 volt input so we had a common mode rejection of about 74 decibels in the unity gain configuration. Let me just add a quick note if you're a home gamer trying to play along. The only way I was able to get the amp to behave this well was to be very tidy with the breadboard, including putting the power supply decoupling on as short leads as I could manage, and using short jumpers everywhere. If your breadboard has DuPont wires flying all over the place, your amp might oscillate even in the test with a gain of 10. If that happens, and your power supply decoupling is okay, try adding the compensation capacitor, and start with 100 picofarads or so. Some of these breadboard amps can't be stabilized at unity gain, no matter what compensation you use. I was both careful and lucky with this one. This episode has been putting together nearly everything we've learned in this series so far. We almost have one each of every transistor configuration that we've looked at, making them run in harness to reject common mode signals, provide gain, and reduce the output impedance. Do you know what we've succeeded in doing? We've reinvented the op amp. Badly. Let's take a look at the internal schematic of a typical bipolar op amp so you can see what I mean. I'll use the popular LM358 as an example. Here on the left, you can see the differential pair that provides the common mode rejection. The bases of the differential pair 
are being driven by emitter followers to boost the already high input impedance even further. Instead of a single collector resistor, the pair is driving a current mirror. That's providing an extremely high effective collector resistance, limited only by early effect, so this stage has an enormous differential gain. The gain stage comes next. It needs to have three transistors, two of which are followers, to establish the proper biasing. The designers of the LM358 didn't use our ugly trick of putting the collector of the differential pair up near the power supply. The 358 designers also needed a compensation capacitor around the gain stage for stability down to unity gain. Compensation isn't just for dodgy breadboard setups. Finally, there's the output stage. The top transistor is a Darlington, the bottom one is a plain PMP. There's a resistor between the two output transistors. It has several functions, including avoiding thermal runaway on the output stage. I'll discuss that when we get into power electronics. Another function that it has is to sense the output current, because this chip is designed not to destroy itself if the output is short-circuited. This extra transistor sees the voltage drop across the resistor. When the voltage drop exceeds a diode drop, it steals all the base current from the follower stage and effectively turns off the output transistors. All the pull-up and pull-down resistors have been replaced with current sources. This means that the amplifying stages all have enormous gain. The idea is the same as putting the current source in the tail of the long-tailed pair. There are a lot of little improvements, but the principle is the same as the amplifier we just built. Still, taken together, those little improvements had a huge impact. The amplifier we built had a 6 to 8 millivolt input offset. The cheap commercial one has an input offset of 300 microvolts. The final version of our amplifier had a common mode rejection of about 300 microvolts per volt. The commercial one is about 15 times better, 20 microvolts per volt. I didn't measure the input bias current of our amplifier, that is, the current the inputs need to draw even without a signal. Still, we can predict it's going to be the 250 microamp tail current divided by the beta of the input transistors, or about 2.5 microamps. The cheap commercial op amp has an input bias of 10 nanoamps, 400 times smaller. A premium CMOS op amp will have a typical bias current of a few femtoamps, a thousand times smaller than that. Our differential mode input impedance will be twice the intrinsic emitter resistance of the transistors in the differential pair, times the transistor's beta. At least 20k maybe even as big as 50. The commercial amplifier gets 10 megohms in parallel with a tenth of a picofarad. Our common mode input impedance will be the dynamic output impedance of the tail current source times the beta of the input transistors, maybe a couple of hundred megohms in parallel with the base capacitance of the transistors, a few picofarads. The cheap commercial op amp achieves 4 gigohms in parallel with 1.5 picofarads, our open-loop gain was about 500. The cheap commercial device has an open-loop gain of 140,000. A premium op-amp would have an open-loop gain in the millions. And this is why you don't go rolling your own op-amp out of discrete components. So even a cheap commercial op-amp beats the pants off ours. But we've built an op-amp that actually works for some things. From scratch. And we have a lot more understanding about what's going on inside an op amp, which will help us make a lot more sense of the data sheets. I think this has brought us to a really good point to pause our series on transistor circuits. This has covered most of the basics that you need when reading a schematic. You'll at least recognize familiar building blocks. The next thing I'm thinking of doing when we come back to this series is to continue looking at long-tailed pairs, with a particular eye to what happens when we overdrive them and they approach saturation. That's something we're going to need to unlock several circuits that are key in music. The exponential converter, the sign shaper, and the multiplier. So there's still fun ahead in Transistors 101. In the meantime, though, I want to do some more work in our series on op-amps, because there are also a bunch of circuits that we haven't seen there that we're going to need. So there's still a lot of electronics ahead. 
Perhaps you'll want to tell the YouTube algorithm that you want to see the videos that are in store? Until the next time, stay safe, stay healthy, stay curious, and take care of one another. Bye!